Why am I going to do it? And if they don't tell you in the beginning of their book why, then it's probably they have an agenda. Or even if they do have an agenda, they may say their agenda is in there. So it, you've got to be careful, but be sure that we have a reliable Bible. 100%, they know very, 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 very precisely what the truth is. Whether they use it in their translation is totally another matter. Okay, I like the New King James Version personally for my study and for my teaching. But on Sunday, I use the one, the Apologetic Study Bible that he's using right now. I got no problem. I've got countless, I can't tell you how many translations of the Bible I have and how many more I have on the internet that I refer to. Um, who was, was anybody here there? Oh, Pat was there last night. Um, I, uh, in the, this is a good example. In the uh, uh, fourth chapter of Jonah, there's a word that is only used in the fourth chapter of Jonah. It's used four times and it's used nowhere else in the Bible. It's the word kikion, okay? And nobody knows what a kikion is. N nobody. And so what I did is I went to every single translation I could find, probably, what, 20 maybe? And they translated a vine, they've translated a plant, a broadleaf plant, a leafy plant, an ivy. They go through, and I went through all of them. And then a couple of Bibles even said this is a castor oil plant. When they have no idea because nobody knows what a kikulion is, right? But that is what people are doing. They're striving to think of the most logical response to what this word is. Because we know it's a plant, we know that it covered Jonah's head. What kind of a plant would do this and could grow quickly enough over a single night and could die by eating a worm? And they think it through. What is the answer? Nobody's really sure. And so in the NIV, you're going to see at the bottom it says Hebrew unknown. And they're going to let you know. Nobody knows what it is. I like that about the NIV. Is it's being honest to the readers that they don't really know what this Hebrew word is and they're doing the best they can with the information they have. Anyway, so Kikuyon, I even, as I said last night, I even went to uh, the Japanese and I got the word Togoma, right? And I asked my wife, what is Togoma? And she says, I don't know, I've never heard of that. And then she looked in a little footnote and she says, oh, it's a gourd. You know, so they don't know either. You know, just whatever. So, okay, anyway, didn't mean to divert so much, but if you got a question like that, I hate to give you a quick answer and dismiss it. We have a very reliable Bible, despite the confusion we see here. Okay, it seems confused, but then one more thing, just so you understand why I'm saying this. I've done this before, and you may not have been in this class, but it'll help you process how you can know that something is correct, even if you've got 5,000 different translations, and 27 of them are completely different. And I'll use this example. Oh, we'll say you, not I, because I don't need the money. You have, uh, how do you spell it? W-O-N-O. -O. You have one A million, okay, dollars. D-O-L-L-A-R-S, okay? And then I say here, you have one A million and, and you can already do it off of these two sentences, not a problem, because you know English, and you look at this and you already know what that says. Somebody made a typo right there. Okay, now you get another manuscript and you read this one, oh, he's got a typo here, got an X, right? But that one says that. You already know. So if you're reading the Greek and there's a word that's obviously got an error in it, you can dismiss it immediately. But if you have 5,686 copies of this and three of them have an error in the sentence and none of the errors are in the same place, then you know 100% reliable what you have in that particular translation. No doubt about it. And then if you have this word and this word turned around in one of the translations, you know that the person was reading and he stopped and he got dyslexia for a second and he wrote it backwards. That happens. And then we have another thing. We have uh, in Greek, they have what's called minuscule, which would be like writing all in small letters with no spaces. It's all just run together, small letters, okay? And what happens is once in a while, and it even happens in English, is if you take all your words and put them together without spaces, you can actually read the sentence two different ways, the division. And so what do they do? They have to decide which one is correct based on the context. Or they can go to what's called majuscules, which are Greek texts which are all in capital letters. And maybe there's spaces in there. And then they know that that space actually belongs here and not here. I don't care. There, it is such a science looking for errors 
in the Bible and how the errors are made. They can even tell if you have a paragraph here and a paragraph here and the name Lord here and the Lord here and then after the word Lord is a different word and they, there's an error. They know that the person looked up at the wrong paragraph while he was translating. They, they've got a name for every type of error that you could possibly think of. Books of just names of types of errors. It's, it's incredible what people do with their lives for the sake of God's word. How tenderly they, they go after it, pursuing this. So don't worry about those things, but these are all examples of how textual criticism works. And in the end, I have no problem saying that the King James Version is not the only version, and you won't go to hell if you read something else. Okay, understand that. God is not going to send you to hell if you don't read the King James Version. But it is, and when I have a real question about something, and I do this about once every, maybe twice a week, when I have a question about a particular issue and I can't get it resolved, I will always go to the King James Version because those people really, really, really took their time and they really thought things through in a way that other people didn't. They were very contemplative. You've got to figure, they didn't have TVs, they didn't have all those distractions back then. Those people sat down and they really knew what they were doing. However, having said that, because now I'm talking about comparing this verse with this verse, it will be very, very accurate. But the problem is that they didn't have things like proper metallurgy back then, which we've developed today. So in the case of saying bronze, they will say brass. Well, brass hadn't even been developed by then. Brass is an alloy. It's something that is man-made, tin and copper, right? Well, what does it say in Deuteronomy 8.9? 8, 8, it says you will dig br brass out of the fields. It's impossible. Brass doesn't come out of the fields. So there are these discrepancies, but it is not a doctrinal issue. It is a lack of metallurgical, metallurgical understanding at the time of that translation. Same thing with gemstones. Same things with other things that science has developed. It's not an error, it's just a lack of understanding. Now we know that you dig bronze, or what is it, copper, I'm sorry, copper out of the hills. And then bronze is one type of thing, brass is another. Anyway, so keep that in mind is that no errors in the Bible, in the original manuscripts, and we are very slowly in history getting back to an original manuscript just because of people's efforts, and it takes it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of dedicated research. So that was a long time on one verse, but Gershon, all because of one word. Okay, anyway, go ahead, please. What, what, what verse is it? I didn't get it to begin with this time, but the beginning one that you're reading now. Uh, where are we? 7, 6, 19, 6, 17, 18, 19 is where we started. But the chapter? Uh, Exodus 6, 1. Exodus. Yes, Exodus. Thank you. Now, got it. Okay, go ahead. The sons of Merari were Mali and Mushi. I love those names, I gotta tell you. I'm sorry, I just had to interject that. <laughs> Mali and Mushi. <laughs> and you pronounced them exactly as I would. I don't know if that's correct or not, but I've never looked up the original, but that's how I would pronounce it. These were the clans of Levi, according to their records. Amram married his father's sister, married his aunt. Jeez, yeah. Joe, Jochebed, Jochebed. Okay, now here's a question for you. What was the name of Amram's wife in the movie The Ten Commandments? <laughs> Come on now. Charlton Heston was, um, who was he? He was uh, Moses. Who was his mother? Remember, he, he grabbed her and he held her and he asked her name to Pharaoh's, uh, his mother, the Pharaoh of Pharaoh's daughter or whoever adopted him. What was it? Been too long since oh, I thought you said it. Okay, oh, you don't remember? Ben, uh, it's been. <laughs> oh, ben. No, 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 no. You said it's been too long, and when you said that, I thought you said her name. No, it's Yoshebel. Oh, yeah. Yoshebel. And why would they pick the name Yoshebel instead of Jacobed? Well, wouldn't you? Are you going to have somebody named Jacobed or Jacobed in a movie? Yoshebel sounds so much prettier. So anyway, when I heard that, I thought, that's not her name. And I went back and I checked, and sure enough, they changed it for the movie. But anyway, you're thinking of Ben-Hur, the, the next movie. But anyway, when you said that's not her name, something sounded like Yoshebel. So anyway, okay. Okay, Jacobed, who bore him Aaron and Moses. Amram, Amram lived 137 years. Okay, so once again, you have another life age. And all of these life ages, and taking it in context, shows you the time that they were in Egypt, and it also shows you the, uh, uh, you know, how 
things progressed after that. And you can make a, a pretty accurate genealogy of what is going on rather than the 430 year thing that we talked about a week or two ago. 430 years in Egypt, they weren't in Egypt 430 years by any stretch. I mean, even at the very, very farthest, if they were to have had children at 12 years old and died at this ancient age, it would have been, it would have been at the very most 300 years. I, I, I got to tell you, anyway, I got the study on my, my uh, website, but trust that they were in Egypt and Canaan for 430 years and it's as Paul says in the New Testament the time the 430 years is reckoned from Abraham's covenant all the way down to the receiving of the law 430 years okay Paul says that in Galatians and that supports the Bible not what the Jewish people have said and why because they're hiding in the Old Testament a certain amount of time in order to hide the fact that Jesus really is the Messiah okay no doubt about it and as I said next Sunday, not this coming Sunday, I'll speak on Rosh Hashanah, and then that Wednesday is going to be the new year in Israel. It will be the year, according to the Jewish nation, 5772, when it's actually much closer to the year 6000. Just suppose they hid 250 year, 215 years in this account, okay? 430 years. It says in the Bible, in the Jewish reckoning 430 years and it's actually as Josephus said 215 years okay that's what Flavius Josephus says and as I said you can go through there and you can reckon and it's about that you know this if you just go through these ages well if it says next in a week and a half from now the year 5772 and we add on 215 missing years what do you come up to it's five six seven and then eight and then seven, eight, nine, five, nine, eight, nine. We are very close to the year 6,000. And there are other years that are missing. So we may actually be over the year 6,000. We might be in. I, we're so close to Jesus coming. I, I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you it's coming. I don't know when, but I, it's things like this that just get me so excited because, you know, Rosh Hashanah, it's coming up. It's going to be a new year and everything is, you know. I, wow. I, I don't want to divert. What? I know I am. I don't know about anybody else, but I've always said that when the Lord comes and that trumpet blows, I'm going to jump so that I'm up higher than everybody else. Oh, thank you. Oh. You don't watch Huckabee, do you? Yeah, I don't even get him anymore. I, I just don't have him on my TV. Mm -hmm. And she also built what you do. She built the this is the last generation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you got you got to give credit to the past. And they've thought that for the past 2,000 years. At the 1,000-year millennium, people said, he's coming. And then the Millerites in the 1800s and all these people have kept. But I, because why, what is, and I've said this before, what Israel is the. Israel is a nation. Israel, nation. without Israel as a nation, it, it wouldn't have happened. Because he said, I am returning to Israel. He said that very clearly when he was yeah. coming down on Palm Sunday. Because they are back there's nothing, there's really nothing to preclude him coming back now. But people didn't know that back then. Like I said, when you're looking, the Jews are, I said this in Sunday school, if anybody wasn't here yesterday, the Jews are blinded, according, partially blinded. A partial blindness has come to Israel, right? So they're looking through a mirror and they can't see well. Well, if we're on the other side of the mirror looking back, we can't see them well either. And that tells us that we were partially blinded to the Jewish situation. It's not just them, it's us too. And we're both looking through this mirror, and all of a sudden this mirror starts clearing up. The Jewish people are coming to Jesus Christ in droves right now, and we are seeing that the Jews really belong in that land, and they really have a purpose. And so both sides of this mirror, ooh, 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 oh, I'm just my, oh, I can't stand it. Harold Camping. Yeah. Oh. And, uh, so somebody asked her, uh, when do you think the end is coming? And she says, I don't know. Yeah, that's right. And says, nobody knows because God won't even tell the son. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She was very impressive. Oh, yeah. She's, she's a good lady. Yeah. She good lady. Is. Yes, she is. A, Gra uh, Billy Graham's daughter, Ann Lott. Ann Lott Graham. Is she married to one of them? Or? Grand Lott. Am Grand Lott. Thank you. There you go. I just suddenly got a brain Caesar there. Lots. Oh, okay. Huh. Anyway, that's da daughter of Billy Graham. Just like, uh, what's his name? Franklin. They little rebellious when he was young, but now he's kind of back in line. And Yeah. Oh, boy. 